Welcome to Entrepreneurial Reality with Bash. Every week we'll be speaking to startup and scale up founders to learn about them, their ambitions for the business, goals and objectives. Every conversation is a moment in time documenting entrepreneurs' current situation with a view to coming back next year to see how they are getting on. Each journey will be different. Each innovation could be game changing. I hope you enjoy. Series one, episode 24 on entrepreneurial reality with Bash. I'm very glad to have with me today Giuseppe Schionti, the founder and CEO at Novameet. Welcome, Giuseppe. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you liked my project and happy to share my knowledge and my vision on that. Uh, much appreciated. So let's go right into it then. Let's talk about Novameet. What is the business what, that you're building? Yes, so um, I build a structure uh, in which I develop a new technology. And this technology was built on bioprinting strategies. Bioprinting strategy normally are used for biomedicine. So normally in the field of tissue engineering, especially, in which we try to build tissues to regenerate um, humans, uh, part, human parts or human uh, organs and tissues. I was a bioengineer and then I became... A prof- assistant professor in bioengineering and also a researcher in the field of tissue engineering and I discovered a way to use this technology to create plant-based uh, meat substitutes so the idea of Nova Meat is to use this technology and to exploit the potential of it to develop new technologies and uh, new products that could serve as plant-based meat substitutes. Well, how did you come about building the technology in the first place then? Yeah, give us an insight into that. Yes, I've been working in the last 10 years uh, in the field of uh, bioengineering. And in the last three years, I was focusing on generating something that really resembled a tissue of uh, an, animal, an animal organ. And uh, one day I discovered that I was able to create some parts that were very similar to the actual uh, organs of the animal uh, but uh, in terms of texture, consistency, and also macroscopically, the structure resembled the tissue I wanted to generate. So specifically, I was uh, working on generating a substitute for an ear that was just a a prototype to generate an artificial ear. And I was uh, surprised because I showed that to my colleagues one day and uh, they said, Giuseppe, this is uh, gross. It really looks like an ear. And then I thought, uh, if it really looks like an ear, it means that uh, we're going in the good direction. And so I went to talk with some very important chefs here in Barcelona, uh, Ferran Andrea and uh, the group of Seyer de Carroca. These are Michelin star restaurants. And uh, we thought together that if I could use the same technology, but generate a piece of uh, meat instead, so a substitute to meat, which is uh, normally what we refer when we talk to animal muscle that we eat, uh, then that would have been uh, very, very interesting. So there is a, a trend at the moment of moving away from the traditional meat to a plant-based alternative. What's driving you to create this business and deliver upon uh, the demand for plant-based meat? Yes, this is correct. There is a very big movement of, uh, we call it flexitaria movement. So there is a big number of people who, has not, who are not uh, vegetarians and vegans, but they would like to find a substitute uh, to meat for different reasons. The main reason why I do that is for environmental reasons. It means that uh, this technology can help fight climate change in the sense that livestock is unsustainable for the environment. But uh, livestock is also inefficient, so many companies are looking for alternatives and many Uh, governments, including the Chinese government. So for that reason, uh, technology of this kind and the product that is a plant-based meat is very important in this moment and there are many uh, investments in this uh, direction and many big companies like Nestlé, Unilever and so on are looking to even uh, buy um, technologies uh, that could serve for uh, generating meat substitutes. You mentioned the technology. Does Nova Meat represent the machinery, the technology itself to do the printing? Or is it the printing and the, the product as well? Yes, uh, Nova Meat has uh, 
submitted a patent that uh, covers not only the technology in the sense of uh, composition of the paste that we use uh, to extrude, but also the process. Uh, so this uh, 3D printing or micro extrusion process that we need to use to generate a substitute to meet the really resembles a piece of animal meat in terms of its uh, microstructure, uh, composition, but also you can in use uh, the same ingredients that you would use when you create a plant-based hamburger that tastes like meat, but also we try to cover in our patent the product. So we will see in the next couple of months if uh, the office, uh, the patent office, first it will be the patent office uh, here in Europe, if they will agree that everything is uh, innovative, so they will uh, give grant our uh, patent. And then if that is the case, we will work on the three parts of it. So the composition that in the future can look like capsules where you can add material, uh, which is uh, natural, but it's plant-based. And you can have three kinds of capsules. For example, you could have a beef capsule, a chicken breast capsule, and a tuna capsule. And then you could also use a printer that we are developing. So you can use this as if it was an espresso, right? And then the second year, Novamit will focus on the scaling up. So if in the first year we develop the technology to generate a piece of beef stick that really resembles an animal beef stick, but it's plant-based, and also a chicken breast, and also a tuna steak, in the second year we will focus on scaling up. And that will be a different technology, so it will not be a 3D printer, but will be a bigger machines that allows for production of uh, tons of products. Not only are you focusing on the, the direct-to-consumer market, you're also looking at the manufacturing, the product, food production at scale. Yes, it's correct. So in the first year, if we are able to generate a very good MVP, but also a 3D printer and also capsules, that will be interesting for the sector of restaurants, sector of hospitals, and even for space agencies such as SpaceX, for different reasons I will explain now in a second. But for a second part, when we try to develop technology for mass production, then the business model will be a little bit different. We will uh, decide then if we are going to just sell the license in the form of uh, the technology, in the form of licenses to different manufacturers, food manufacturers, or if we decide that we want to produce ourselves. So you mentioned that you were going to talk about uh, the reasons for like, the space agencies. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah, this is very interesting. So um, I think it's very good to ask that. Um, in the future, not only there is this advantage of having plant-based substitutes, uh, if they really resemble meat, they can uh, help the planet, help for animal welfare, and uh, uh, being more healthy and uh, improving the food supply, but also there is other advantages. I told you hospitals and space agency. In the case of hospitals, for uh, so using that for um, biomedical applications. But uh, for a space agency, this is very cool because uh, in the future, they are already studying in their international space station, the bioprinting technique or 3D printing techniques, even for food. What they will like uh, to have in the future for a longer travel, especially, will be something that is uh, food that is uh, with a range of textures. In a sense that uh, astronauts, when they don't eat food with, with a good consistency, that can be a problem for uh, the jaw and for uh, the, the muscles and for the bones that we use uh, when we chew, right? And uh, that's the same what happens uh, when we don't walk and we are in uh, space, the astronauts and don't, don't walk for a period, so that can decrease the mass of their uh, muscle and bones in their um, legs, right? So the same can happen uh, if they don't choose. So it's very important to have uh, the possibility to produce a wide range of uh, food, including food that is uh, with the range of consistency of, the, of meat. I just uh, want to throw in the question here that I got on Twitter. Schlange said, I'd be interested to know the plant-based ingredients used and the nutritional value. You mentioned chicken, beef, tuna. How do you come about the nutritional elements of that yes. end product? So um, while I'm working now on the first two steps, which is the texture, so a wide range of textures, including the one of beef, uh, chicken breast, and tuna, and on the appearance, then the next steps will be 
taste and nutritional values. So to get uh, taste and nutritional values together, what you need to use is a variety of plant-based ingredients. What I use now in the first prototype is a mix of uh, pea protein, rice protein, and in some cases I also use some algae. That is done because uh, when you mix different um, plant-based uh, materials, in this case um, rice and pea, you get a mix of uh, essential amino acids. So you get all the amino acids you would need to have a, a more uh, balanced uh, diet. So that would be not okay if you just eat uh, rice alone, rice protein alone, or pea protein alone. So what I use now is a mix of uh, rice protein, pea protein, and algae. That is also, uh, the algae also are useful because of the fibers that they include. So now the nutritional properties of the first prototype allow me to create something that has the proteins in the range of 25%, so between 20 and 30%. 25% would be similar to the one of beef sticks, and 30% would be more similar to an animal chicken breast. And then, regarding the fat, I focused on having the less amount, uh, the small, smallest amount of fat possible. So now I'm just having the prototype one, 1.5%, which is very, very low amount of fat, and that will increase when we need to give the taste to the product. But now it's a good uh, starting point because we have, as I said, from 20 to 30% of protein and 1.5% of fat, and very little amount of uh, carbohydrates, which is similar to the actual case when you eat animal meat, uh, and also a an higher amount of fibers, which is important because uh, in the uh, Western diet, we normally have access to all the proteins and amino acids that compose these proteins. What we don't eat enough is fibers, so that we would normally eat from uh, different cereals and from uh, uh, some kind of, uh, for example, nuts, cashews, and so on. So you, you're saying that you're building in the fibrous content as much as the minerals and vitamins, amino acids as well? Yes, that is correct. As I told um, before, this is just a first prototype so uh, I'm doing that uh, because normally it's very complex to have this amount of uh, protein and fat so I'm focusing now in demonstrating that our technology at, at Nova Meat is able to have this kind of uh, resemblances to the animal meat but in the future we will try when we focus on the taste and nutritional properties we will try to select the ingredients so that is more similar to animal meat than now, uh, in the sense that we'll also make sure that there is enough uh, vitamins, minerals, and an amount of uh, salt that is uh, not too much. So we'll try to create something that could serve as a substitute, but also trying to improve that. Uh, for example, we will not, of course, include ingredients that are animal-based. There will, won't be cholesterol. It won't be carcinogenic. Uh, as uh, animal meat so there is some other some advantages it's not exactly a substitute of meat there is some advantages and we are working on uh, having the, the right ingredients um, you have to think that now the burgers that have the taste of animal meat but I, the, that are plant-based such as the, the most famous impossible a burger and beyond uh, burger these ones have an amount of fat that is a little bit higher than the one i would like to uh, get to we are working in many companies on this direction and having different kinds of plant-based uh, meat substitutes is very important and if we do that if we use different ingredients in our different recipes so the different companies we will also have the possibility to avoid eating for example always soy-based uh, plant-based meat substitutes uh, which is the case right now. I am getting frustrated with the lack of variety that is available in the in the market today. Yes, I have another uh, thing to say. Having um, an alternative to soy is important because of uh, deforestation, uh, especially here. I am in Europe, I am in Barcelona, and we depend on importing soy from um, US, Brazil, and that is a little bit of a problem, not only because the price can uh, change and we don't control it here, uh, that in Europe, 
but also it's important because for health related reasons uh, there are some people that are affected by the amount of uh, phytoestrogen that are in uh, soy and that can cause an alteration of the normal balance of testosterone and estrogen we have in our body. So uh, it's important to have alternatives to soy. Are you currently looking for funding? Yes, I have to tell you I'm already in contact with different uh, investors. Those are, some of them are business angels, some of them are venture capitalists of the space. Um, where I'm working in, and some are even uh, corporates. Um, I think I have already covered my seed round, so I think I am just selecting the best partners to go in with in this uh, first part of the process. This is my first startup, but uh, I, I recognize uh, the business of plant-based meat substitutes is growing very much, and it wasn't a big problem to find uh, investors. We are just describing now the first activities that we are going to do here at Novami to the investors to agree on the amount. The amount is around 350,000 euros, which will be $400,000 in the US, more or less. And that would allow me to go to the second round, the round A, with uh, an MVP, a 3D printer that is uh, robust, and the capsules that are packaged. As I told you, uh, beef, chicken breast, and tuna steak capsules. And in terms of the capsules themselves, are they going to be delivered as a subscription model? Or is it uh, as you consume, you just keep buying more? Uh, at the beginning, what will be the interesting uh, um, model would be to start with uh, some innovative restaurants and uh, develop with them as lead users these capsules. When these capsules are ready, then we'll first focus on. Uh, restaurants and in the future we will hopefully also open the business model to direct consumers so that somebody could have that even at home and then in space as well like star trek yeah space is uh, very interesting you know i have a priority which is uh, trying to help life on earth first at the same time in parallel you should also think uh, for the next centuries it's very interesting it will give uh, very much attention on my project if I'm able to test and demonstrate that I can send to space lyophilized uh, powders that are proteins, fat. So in this sense, there will be powders that are lighter than if you would send some hydrated uh, ingredients or hydrated food. So uh, sending this lighter food in the form of uh, powders and when you are there, in space, mixing these uh, ingredients to create a personalized food, a personalized product for the astronaut that would change during the week so that you can have a variety of products with a variety of uh, uh, ingredients, but also a wide range of uh, consistency. It's very important, but also allows to have uh, these powders that can be mixed with a container of water and using a micro extruder or a 3D printer that. Uh, creates a customized food. This is very interesting. I think it will be interesting not only for me, but also for the people in the space of uh, food innovation. Let's go back to you, Giuseppe. And you mentioned it was your first startup. Yes. What made you decide to leave your previous research and development roles to become a founder of a business? I thought I would have been a, a, a professor in university in the future. What happens is that sometimes you find something you don't expect in life. So what happened was that I was prepared in the field of research where, where I was working in. I developed an innovative solution, an innovative product, and I didn't get a very good feedback from the university uh, because this was something uh, maybe too much innovative. And so the, this uh, decision to start a startup was uh, not only driven by myself, but also by the environment. I think when you work on something, when you have passion for something, and you find something new, and you really believe this as uh, some uh, future, it's like, as uh, Peter Tyler would say, you find uh, some secret. If you find some secret and you really believe, you're right. Uh, not only because uh, you believe it, but also because you demonstrated that having some experience studying that thoroughly and asking experts in the field, then you can risk. Um, so I decided to risk. I decided to go out from uh, university, from my academic career, 
when I discovered that uh, this could have uh, a potential and I was sure about that, in my case, I was able to patent this technology if I really uh, put some energy and effort on that. So I decided, as uh, you would normally do, normally the idea is to have uh, started that as a project B. So you do your normal uh, work, uh, but on the side, you save some time for your B project in which you develop your idea. So I studied, I went visiting experts in the field, and I discovered that uh, I could patent that. When I discovered that, I checked with the university if that was possible. That was possible, according to them, but they didn't want to support me in that because this was not focused on biomedical research, which was what my research center was about. And so I decided to go all in and uh, patent that during summer on my own. And then uh, when I saw that this could have some uh, interesting uh, response by companies, by consumers, and by governments, I decided to launch a startup. And that was uh, almost easy once you already walk in that direction. How long has that been, just out of interest? So, February 2017, that's where when I developed the ear, and that was kind of gross. So from that moment, I developed a prototype. I presented my normal research at a conference here in Barcelona, and I decided also to give some hints about how these bioprinting strategies could be used also to create meat substitutes. And so I told them directly, um, if you invite me to give another conference, I will uh, tell you how I can create something similar to a meat substitutes. So then I was invited there and some uh, journalists started asking me, uh, you start a startup also when you have your project, but you see that there is some interest. Not only you are the only the crazy one, but there is some uh, journalists, newspapers that want to talk about it. Um, so I gave some uh, only one interview in that moment. So maybe that was summer 2017. And then I decided to stop giving any interviews because I thought that could be patentable. And if you think uh, this is innovative, you should not give too much information, right? Because you need to cover it uh, and protect it. So I decided to start protecting it, that and I stopped all my interviews with newspapers when I was working uh, in the university on the side between uh, September 2017 and June, May 2018. I checked that this was uh, patentable and uh, I left university in June 2018 and I decided to write the patent, the draft in summer and I patented that in August 2018 when I was uh, during summer but I was not working anymore at the university. So I left university in June 2018, patent uh, this in August 2018 and then started uh, talking with uh, newspapers, investors, restaurants and I opened the startup on the 2nd of November 2018. Now that we are talking, it's almost uh, three months. In these three months, I think I secured the seed round and I worked on the first steps, which is uh, the first uh, prototype. And now in the next uh, few weeks, I will uh, generate the version 2.0 of the prototype and close this uh, seed round so that I have enough investment to go through the first year and develop the a proper MVP and that would be ready for from uh, in around 12, 18 months from now. That's the plan across the next 12 months is to build out a later version of your technology. I will create a uh, version 2.0 in which uh, this uh, prototype has the texture of a piece of meat but also the appearance of uh, chicken breast, beef stick and tuna stick. The version 3.0 will be the taste and version 4.0 will be having appearance, taste, consistency, and also nutritional properties that are controlled uh, through quality tests and safety tests. So I will have this uh, kind of version that we, I call MVP, the version 4.0 at the end of the year. And in parallel, it's important to tell that I will also develop these uh, capsules that are uh, packaged, a robust 3D printer sold together with the capsules to restaurants in the first place. There's a real focus on reducing plastic at the moment. So when you say capsules, are they in a container or will they be in some sort of metal container or recyclable container yes um now i i have to buy them from a company that makes them uh, in plastic so i i wash them i clean them 
so that I don't need to throw them away. But in the future, it's uh, very important because I don't think that uh, livestock is the only uh, urgent problem that we have. I think we have three urgent problems. One is uh, livestock, one is uh, plastic pollution in uh, oceans, especially and microplastics. And the third one is uh, the waste. So uh, projects, zero waste, avoid plastic, and try to eat meat substitutes instead of meat. I, I think that the three of them are very urgent and we are working the three of them. In the sense of uh, meat substitutes, this is very direct. The answer is very easy to understand why the plant-based meat substitutes would be an alternative for some people, not only from uh, vegans and vegetarians, but also from those people that call themselves or are called uh, flexitarians. Uh, so diminish the amount of animal uh, proteins uh, in their diet. Regarding plastic, if you change the food supply and in the future you can have for example, uh, supermarkets that can, or restaurants that can prepare their food without uh, packaging through the normal food supply, but maybe have these uh, ingredients that, uh, that, of course, they're not expired, but they can reuse them before uh, deciding, before expiring, so that they can um, lyophilize them, dehydrate them, and this will extend their expiration date so that they can use them in the future again for themselves, for the restaurants, for the supermarkets, but also for projects, humanitarian projects. So send this uh, food in form of uh, powder to rural areas of the planet where uh, this is uh, much needed. This, is, this will be a, a solution for uh, plastic. I mean, one, will be one of the solutions of the plastics problem. And regarding zero waste, you might understand that this same concept. So in the future, having supermarkets that instead of throwing the food away, can uh, lyophilize or dehydrate it and save it so that for the consumers day by day they can produce the right amount of food that they will be requested so that they decrease the amount of uh, waste this uh, project Novamis project I believe can have an impact if this is successful can have an impact on the three of them livestock plastic and uh, zero waste big big project ahead of you <laughs> Uh, you need to have different uh, startups working in the same uh, direction, right? Mm -hmm. And together, uh, not only as consumers, but together also as uh, businesses, we should go in the same direction. So don't believe uh, no amits will uh, be able to have the biggest impact on the three of them. I will focus on having the biggest impact it can and uh, also being uh, viable for uh, scaling up, etc., so I hope that many other startups and many other companies will follow. I look forward to hearing your experiences when you come back next year. That'd be great. It would be great to share them. And it's interesting in my case because coming from uh, research, uh, some, uh, some listeners can be interested in how uh, after 10 years of research and academia career, you decide to go out of that and start in uh, startup. That follows on really nicely to my next question. What lessons have you learned to date that you could share with the listeners? You, you talk about from an education, sort of academic career, to become an entrepreneur after 10 years. That is a, a significant change, a significant step. But you're leveraging your knowledge, yes. you're leveraging your skills to address a particular problem from an economic standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, and in terms of the demand on food production as it grows into 2020, 2025, and so on. Yes, having a very strong scientific background and having developed an innovative technology, I was very respected uh, by the, the medias uh, in the sense that uh, they're not normally used to deal with um, uh, research that are very expert in their fields and decide to go through a startup. So there is an advantage when you come from research. You have enough scientific background to answer all the scientific questions. You can demonstrate that your technology has some value. So you don't need to work as a marketing person in the beginning. You just need to tell the truth uh, and say the why your technology is uh, more advanced and give some advantages compared to the others in the market. So there is some advantage. There is, of course, some disadvantage. You have, when you start, not from business, so in my case, uh, from uh, science and specifically from academic career, what happens is that you are uh, not ready to talk directly to investors. So you should read some books. You should talk, especially talk to experts, talk to your uh, colleagues and friends that are prepared in the business side and in some cases uh, decide to form a team from the beginning. In my case, I decided that I could defend my project on my own at the beginning. 
So I decided to go alone and present this to TEDx conference. Decided to talk about this in the European Parliament, giving a speech there. And uh, I also decided that I could work as a CEO. Uh, normally, uh, this is a decision that depends on the person. Um, I thought that I could make it. I think when you get uh, older, I'm only 32 now, but uh, in the last years, I always thought gradually that life is only one. We have only one shot. We should be remembered to do something good for a planet. This is my case. I always thought that I would like to be remembered for doing something good for the planet. This was my opportunity. I decided to accept it and uh, go through it and even start as a CEO and learning about the business. As I told you, asking experts in, uh, in that field, but also reading uh, many books. Focusing on learning and getting yourself to a position where where you're comfortable with the knowledge as being a business person as much as somebody who's very well respected in the world of academia. What books could you recommend to the listeners? Starting in uh, 2017, I just started with uh, From Zero to One uh, by Peter Thiel on the business side. On the philosophical side, I read through Albert Einstein's books, specifically some uh, recopilation of uh, his talks on the um, meaning of life and uh, I read some books on uh, Aristoteles and uh, Marcus Aurelius. These books are about uh, life, the meaning of life told by people that are wise persons. So then I decided also to read through Elon Musk uh, biography, to read some, you know, also something more similar to my case in the sense that I am an engineer and I am uh, going through a very innovative process, I mean technology. And then I decided to uh, read also books that are uh, more specific on the field in terms of uh, business model uh, strategies and uh, did some uh, online courses just to read about and hear and listen about some uh, basics on business and then did some uh, presential courses here at uh, in Barcelona. So I prepared in different ways. A significant preparation and uh self-education i'm impressed thank you and i also <laughs> reading now a book which is called 12 against the gods <laughs> this book was famous because once elon musk said it was one of his favorites and uh, this book is first version is from 1929 so it's very very expensive to find it online so in some cases you can find that uh, in uh, libraries in my case i was lucky because i i know spanish so I found an edition from 1945, if I'm correct, that, is, that was from Argentina. So I bought that in uh, Spanish. The interesting part is that this is, uh, there is not a new edition. So you, sh you need to buy that and it's very difficult to look for it around the world. And uh, this book is about uh, important people that are remembered because they went against uh, the society of their uh, times. And they were the only ones thinking that maybe their idea was uh, important, like uh, Alexander the Great, Napoleon. I mean, these are, of course, people in the military side, but also there is uh, people in other parts of different sciences and uh, Casanova. So uh, it's interesting to read that uh, some books that give you the idea that life is uh, one opportunity and you should take advantage of it. And if you really believe in some uh, project, you really have your own project is even better because you have an extra of passion, an extra of a drive, and also you find a meaning in your life. You find yourself more happy. And that's great. You, you mentioned Elon Musk. Uh, I suppose that's the entrepreneur and business owner you're following and admire. Yes. I mean, Elon Musk, I admire him. And in some cases, I almost agree on many parts of uh, what he says. I also respect Peter Thiel also, but I don't agree with um, maybe in uh, other political uh, senses. I admire very much uh, people from the past, especially Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, you know, he's, he was from Italy, inventing on his own, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. and so I admire him uh, as well very much. And uh, as a leader, I admire very much uh, Alexander from Macedonia. He was the first one that uh, had the opportunity, was lucky because uh, uh, he was the son of uh, a king. But his teacher was Aristoteles. So uh, his father, Filippo, brought Aristoteles from uh, Athenas to give classes to Alexander. And so Alexander, when he conquered Persia and then went through India, he, he had he was looking in another perspective than anybody else on the world because he was very lucky to be at such a young age, having such a good 
uh, teacher that explained to him how the world was made. All these people, the unlucky part is that uh, they normally die very young when they risk too much. So you should, <laughs> if you start a startup, you should start to go against the gods and go against society. If you really believe your project is a bit different, but try not to be killed, right? Like Alexander or, uh, or other people in the past that uh, were a bit too crazy. <laughs> It, that flows on really well to my next question, and that's very much about balance. And uh, as an entrepreneur in a startup phase, especially, there's a lot of time invested, a lot of time and stress that is applied and built over time. What do you do to clear your mind? And this is a very interesting question because uh, I have a very specific idea on that. Um, you know, Bill Gates this year is always saying, you know, uh, being busy is the new stupid. He's always saying that. He's always admiring uh, Warren Buffett and saying, I always look at the agenda of uh, Warren Buffett, my friend, and he's always uh, empty. I cannot understand how that works. <laughs> so I think now that it's very important, depending on what you are working on. In my case, if you work on innovative solutions, innovative technology, you have to have a very clear mind and a, a global vision. Uh, global vision it means that uh, understanding uh, not focusing too much on uh, your project and reading from other projects every day, learning, having a, a wide vision on, uh, on how the site is going, environment is going, so depending on your business, of course. So in my case, if you want to patent, for example, I remember because I told my girlfriend in, uh, when I was in summer 2018, I remember I told her, I need to walk to the hill that we have next to our house every day because I need to clear my mind and uh, walk alone. So I was going almost uh, any day, every day of the week when I was uh, writing the patent. I was going every day alone uh, up the hill and I really needed that. And you don't need to be stressed. You don't want to be stressed to change the world. If you really want to change the world, you need to be focused when you need to be focused, but also relax and also save some time for your brain to relax and think about the global vision of uh, what you are doing. So I remember that in that period when I was uh, developing the technology, if I was too focused and working too much on that, I would have not done it as good as I've done it. In a sense that you need to be save some time for yourself and understand that uh, sometimes skipping some or not accepting some meetings, not accepting to uh, work too much, can be an advantage. This doesn't mean that you should uh, uh, sleep 10 hours a day if you have a startup, which is impossible, of course. You need to take advantage of all the opportunities, but it also means that you have to find, as you said, some good balance. So in my case, this good balance was to walk. Well, I do some sports, of course, but in my case, in that period, more than sports is uh, walking in nature. Uh, this was very important for me to understand uh, and also reading books about philosophy, the meaning of life, and uh, what's really important. You don't want to focus on uh, your product uh, only. You need to focus on the important, importance of uh, your product and your solution uh, for uh, the good of uh, society, the good uh, for the environment. And for that, you need to save some time for yourself. Well said. So time has flown. There is a question that I do ask uh, to every entrepreneur and mm -hmm. the, the answer will be different, hopefully, every year. And that would be, what would you do differently knowing what you know now? Uh, my case, I was very lucky. I won't, I won't do much different from what I've done. Um, of course, I, will, I already know that when uh, I'm older, I will tell you that uh, you, you, I was right in saving some time for my brain and from uh, not focusing too much on the product. So I will tell you now that um, I'm happy. I would then like to have uh, an education also on the business side to go faster in this period and avoid mistakes. Uh, but I'm, look, I'm finding good solutions and uh, it's important to be, uh, find partners or also find people that would support you as advisors. So I'm happy uh, with what I've done. I will uh, maybe have a different answer next time but um, i think i'm going in the right direction great well giuseppe thank you so much for your time it's great to hear about your project i wish you every success for the forthcoming years ahead thank you you know i'm very optimistic so that will not be as uh, as easy as, as i said 
but if you really want to try to do something uh, important, you should be humble, but be ambitious. So what do you think? We'll have another interesting story to dive into next week. Looking forward to it already. Some questions to you in the meantime. What is your story? What is your reality right now? And what are you working towards? Let me know. So you can connect with me on Twitter. Just type in Bash in the search and you'll find me. So Bash, B-A-S-H. Easy. On Instagram, it's Bash Reality. So that's Bash underscore reality. And on LinkedIn, Benjamin Ashmore. Make sure you subscribe. And until next week, cheers. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.